Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Each week, we hear real-time stories from athletes and CEOs on how to maximize performance through an endurance mindset. Let's get started. Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. I am excited about our guest today. He is a U.S. Navy SEAL Master Chief retired, a Medal of Honor recipient, the founder of Medieva 6, I think I pronounced that right. He has a, rel has a relentless passion for life and a big believer that we are responsible for owning it. His personal slogan is strength through humility. Please welcome Ed Byers. Welcome, Ed. Uh, Greg, uh, thank, thanks for having me. Excited to be on the en Endurance Podcast. And uh, just for clarification, you have Minerva, so the, the Roman goddess of, of war and wisdom. And, and just for historical context, it's what is imprinted on our nation's highest honor, the Medal of Honor. So uh, there is definitely a, a correlation there between my company name and and uh, that honor, which uh, I received uh, going on almost eight years ago now, which is wow. kind of hard to believe. So time slips by for sure. Yes. Um, well, thank you for clarifying and I appreciate the history. So, and I love talking about endurance. And I'd love to know how your endurance mindset has impacted your life unexpectedly. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a context type of uh, individual and, and to give a little bit of background and history so you know where to go in the future. Uh, so, you know, endurance was never really a thing that was a part of my lifestyle growing up. You know, I, I was uh, not the healthiest kid. I had a, a parent that wasn't really in sports and and didn't think with that mindset or mentality and something aw awoke inside of me when I was a senior in high school and you know brought me to the realization that if, if I don't change my ways and my habits there's no way I'm going to go on and uh, accomplish this big, hairy, audacious goal of being a, a Navy SEAL. You know, I grew up in, in Northwest Ohio on, in a f small farm town. And, you know, back in the, in the nineties, there wasn't a whole lot of material, let alone anyone that I knew of that had gone off to do, uh, this very thing and be part of a, an elite special operations, you know, organization. And so as I fast forward, you know, when I, after I started, you know, joining after i joined the military and started to get a understanding of uh what life is like and and what is required from our our men and women in uniform on a daily basis and then realizing that you're about ready to step it up a notch and and try out for one of the the hardest if not the hardest you know, military school in the world basic underwater demolition seal training you start to realize that this is a, it's a, it's a marathon, not, not a sprint. And so you have to really strategically look at how can you bring everything you have each and every day, and then continue to want to do that day after day after day. And it's one of the reasons why, uh, the, our main slogan or motto within uh, the SEAL teams is the only easy day is yesterday. And so it's that understanding that, you know, it, it, as long as you come from a perspective of, you know, optimistic uh, reality, which is, you know, just baseline yourself that today might suck, right? And then you got to do what you have to do to get through the day, uh, whatever that may be, and everything else is gravy. Right. Because if you, you, you're prepping yourself for success, but you know, we all know that Murphy likes to rear its ugly head every, every, uh, opportunity it can. And so to be able to, you know, set conditions in your mind of going, if, if things go bad, if things go all right, huh, well, I was kind of, you know, expecting that, not manifesting it, but you know, I'm prepped for it, right? I'm trained for it. I'm, I'm trained to, to take the punches, to navigate through adversity. And, and that is where you over time develop that, uh, you know, grit, that you know, passive, uh, perseverance and passion for, for stuff that you want to do. So, you know, 
the endurance component in my life and, and where it's constantly, you know, re uh, evaluated itself in my, in my brain of going, oh, you need to keep going and you need to overcome all these different hurdles in your life. And, you know, the, the easiest part of any given scenario is usually the training aspect because you're, you're in a controlled environment and you just have to complete task A to task B to task C. And it all is hard, but it's at least in a controlled environment. The, the real struggle and the real hard part is once you get out of that training environment and now you're operating in the free world on your, on your own and you have all these constant unknowns, you know, unknown unknowns, some potential, you know, uh, how would you say it? You know, when you're expecting some certain potential unknowns from a various course of actions, what's most likely course of actions or potential most deadly course of actions. And you really have to buckle down and understand that at, you got to just keep, you know, pushing through the mud. You got to keep moving through the, the, the valley of the shadow of death. Right. And so, uh, you know, we did that. I did that with great organizations, some really great individuals, human beings, some of the most capable people on the face of the planet for 20 years, one years of my life. And then I had to reset and do it all over again when I pivoted into the civilian sector and wanted to pursue a life in, as an entrepreneur in, in the corporate environment. And so that required me going back to school and taking on that endurance mindset again of going, look at, I'm 40 years old. I'm about ready to embark on one of the most prestigious, you know, uh, MBA programs there is. This isn't going to be easy and it's going to be a couple of years long. Right. And so you got to uh, just continuously reinvigorate yourself and, you know, shoot yourself with that daily dose of, uh, motivation and and discipline and and perseverance because you have a, a end goal of a specific pursuit of passion of wanting to succeed in every chapter of your life and so i would say you know starting this podcast off and and summarizing the past you know 20 uh five years of my professional ad adult life uh, every single component of it has been an understanding of this is a marathon, not not a race, and to and to run a marathon, you need to have that endurance mindset for sure. That's a very well said. Um, you left me a couple breadcrumbs to pick up. One of them, you were talking about your training as a SEAL. Um, curious about the recovery aspect of your training program. You know, we've seen and barely understand what you truly go through on a day-to-day -day basis from what we find on us civilians, what we see on television. And those are grueling days. The, the moment you have a break, how did you handle the recovery from, because you know the next day is going to be following something similar. And so you, you have a very small window to sort of get your mind back in check, get your body to recover as best you can. How did you handle that going through um, going through your Navy, your Navy SEAL training? Well, I, for myself, I, I definitely rooted myself in a lot of prayer because there's, I firmly believe that there's just some things you cannot uh, do on your own, right? When you, when you have hit your max, when, when you're at your breaking point, you're either going to crumble or you're going to persevere. And, and for myself, I found a tremendous amount of hope and energy and strength and, and knowing that when I was at my edge and at my max capacity that, uh, I prayed and, and there was very specific times in the course where I was at a, a broke point and miraculously those times, uh, the request that I had came through, which offered me just a little bit of reprieve. And it, it's hard 
to explain that other than, you know, just knowing that I experienced it. And if it wasn't at that pivotal time, who knows which path I would have taken, but I chose the right path and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So that's, that's for me, n- the number one, you know, the, the hardest times in my life where I, I haven't been able to figure out how to navigate it. I've always relied on, you know, God and my faith to help drive me towards the path. And and what I'm doing right now is, um, is I'm looking at a prayer on my wall right behind me. And it's the, it's one of the prayers that I had and it, the very last sentence of it. And it's a prayer to prayer to Jesus it says, <clears throat> as this, if, if this is what you want me to achieve so that I, um, uh, may use it for your greater purpose. And so <clears throat> may it be for your will, not for, for mine. And I, I look at that going, you know, if I will do all the required steps, I'll put in the hard work, I'll, I'll do everything I can from my perspective. But if you truly want me to, to accomplish this, then, then give me the wisdom and show me the path to walk. And so with buds, you know, that's the very beginning of being a seal. And it's insanely hard. It, there's no doubt about it. You know, there's so our most capable young men uh, try out for this every single year, and a very very small percentage, ten fifteen percent, make it through. And so it's it's literally taking the best of the best and the, and the, the cream of the crop. And you, there is not a lot of time. I mean, it's you're giving everything you got five days a week. Uh, in that course, it's from the early morning to the late night. There's you have a whole lot of extracurricular or extra activity tasks that you need to accomplish even after the school's over with, and you have to get your mind right. You have to recover correctly, and hopefully stay free of injury. On top of all of that other things, some some factors that you can just not control. Right? I mean, you can't <laughs> you can't risk mitigate every single step you take or, you know, sometimes things just happen. And so some big motivators are in, in the now once, you know, I, I put the prayer thing first and then you're, you know, you're, you're dealing in the here and now, uh, physically is, is the people around you, you know, you start to create immense bonds with people that you're sharing adverse experiences with. And so you're you're there for the person to the left and your right and then there's just a strong desire of going i i will not fail like i i i'm not gonna fail i'm i'm not gonna give the satisfaction of anyone that has ever doubted me you know the ability to go i i knew i was right there's no way that person i never thought they were going to make it through begin with right so there's a there's that component of uh proving other people wrong uh I, proving yourself right that you can achieve certain things and not letting the person down to you to your left and your right when you start uh, coming together and working together as a team and they're and they're relying on you to put out every day and so you those are the, there's not a whole lot of time to think about much else right i mean it's 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 not like you can take the time off go to physical therapy and 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 work through an injury for <laughs> x amount of uh, time to your fully 100%, re- you know, recovered. Sometimes you have to work through the pain. Sometimes you have to just suck it up. And, and, you know, there are going to be times when it completely messes with your head when you are in extremely adverse scenarios. And you just got to keep reiterating to yourself that this too shall pass as long as you keep putting one foot in front of the other and you don't give up. And so that's, that's kind of the mentality that you have to take on with, uh, from a, a, a training environment such as uh, SEAL training. So how does that show up in your life now? How does that training, that le- those learnings show up in your life now? Right. I mean, so yeah. it's funny being, being an entrepreneur and having your own consulting company and where you have to go now, go harvest your own income and, and your own food. So. Uh, because from that perspective, a life perspective of living, the military ends up being pretty easy, right? I mean, from the perspective of, you know, you're going to get a paycheck, right? 
you it's a it's an institution that's been refined for hundreds of years now and so there's a lot of great systems in place where you don't have to think about you know from administrative and logistics and just and so all you can all you need to focus on is your training or what your mission essential task lists are and as once you pivot out of that if you choose to not just take the complete retired you know military life of finding a boat and going fishing or living out in the woods and going hunting all the time now you now you got to think of all that you become your own entire you know support structure and administrative structure and and everything else like that and so it's not easy making a hard pivot working for an institution that's provided you with all these backside or back office, you know, comforts that you don't realize that you have and then moving directly into an environment where now you're the one that's got to make, especially when you're starting out, filling out all the paperwork, filing all the taxes, finding, you know, doing all your own marketing, you know, being your own uh, website curator, you know, and then finding your own clients and then working through how to, you know, interact and, and make sure you bring a high quality product to your clients because that's, what's paying the bills. And, and so keeping that same mentality of, you know what, nobody said this was going to be easy. Um, you put yourself in this scenario Yes, sometimes it's going to suck, but it's worth the reward. Like most things that are hard, if you keep persevering through it, eventually you'll get to the top of the mountain. And then, you know, all of those struggles and those worries that you had, uh, you know, for all those years kind of fade away because you're, you're seeing yourself achieve, right? And it, and it takes a while to get, you know, your ground, your feet underneath you and, and to start to see some true, you know, productivity from all your efforts and results. And I, I literally take myself from a timeline perspective and, and overlay it from my early years in the military. And it's like, well, you didn't just show up at a SEAL team. Right. It took years of training to get there incrementally, little by little, um, to get to the level of competency needed to operate in a special operations unit. Well, that's going to not going to be any different when you're now an, an uh, op- entrepreneur and a business owner. You know, it's going to take years of study and years of, you know, on the job practice and implementation to finally get down your rhythm and figure out what's what works what sticks and and to be able to um rely on so i'm applying the exact same mentality that i had in all those years of military service and overlaying it right into you know the civilian side of life now and and there's there's really no difference because if you take any other look at it you'd be like yeah, i probably would just walk away from it all because you you know Instead of you know, looking at the mountain going, how am I going to climb that? You just, you just got to start figuring out what the pathway is. So let's assume we've got an audience member who's in military service currently and is contemplating an entrepreneurial journey post-military. What advice would you give him or her? Uh, just know that there's, there's no easy pathway right? Uh, and unless you're part of the ultra lucky few that somehow found a, a mentor that's uh, willing to hand walk you through and navigate all the pitfalls involved with being an entrepreneur, but, but that's highly unlikely. And, and just understanding that, you know, an entrepreneur is and 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 small business owner is not a, a nine to five job. It's a it's an all in all the time thing. And so you have to be you have to be ready for that. But there is a lot of freedom of knowing that, you know, you're your own what we call like canopy commander, right? I mean, you're in charge of the route that you're gonna 
take and, and figure out your pathway to success. And so, you know, it, it there's a reason why I, I don't know the exact statistics off my head, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's well over 80% of, of businesses fail within the first couple of years is because they can't navigate the, the valley of death, right? And they, they can't figure out how to commercialize a product or a service and, and get it to a point where they're running, you know, cash flow positive within their organization. So, you know, I would just say anyone out there that's wanting to do that is you just got to, if you have a passion for an, a product, an idea, or a service, is that the overwhelming majority, unless you're the statistical anomaly, is going to be years of grinding before you you see some reward, you know, from all your you know hard work, right? And and as as long as you don't quit, right? Be you know, it's usually right at the point where people are said, "I fed it, I had enough," that they're at that military crest, right? You know, the right below the peak of the mountain, and they and about ready to look into the valley and see. You know what they have achieved it is as long as you don't quit at that military crest where you're still trying to, where you still can't see the top. Uh, it's 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 worth it, and you just gotta you have to keep that in, in mind. It's it's not going to be an easy path. You're, you're going to have to consume a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of competition in, in the marketplace nowadays. It seems like you're, you know, everybody's coming up with you know, an idea that's close to yours or a service that's close to yours nowadays, they just seem to pop up everywhere, a large part because of social media. Uh, it has, does a great job of of undermining people's um, desire to want to do something because they already think there's so many people in the marketplace doing that that product or that service. But, uh, you know, it's, if you have a, if you have a desire for it, you just got to understand it's going to take a lot of effort to go to go for it, and there, there's not going to be an easy pathway. Me, the nice part about being a veteran, though, is it can open up a lot of doors. But that's all it does. It gets your foot in the door. It gets you a a seat at the table for a moment. And and uh, but there's nobody else there that's going to be doing the heavy lifting for you. You got to do that yourself. Yeah, and it's it's extremely difficult to know when you're at that military crest because sure. you think you've gotten there and you push over and next thing you know, there's actually a bigger mountain behind you. Yeah. Um, that said, I wouldn't trade my entrepreneurial life for a, another life. Um, so I'm curious for you, Ed, any unexpected joy in your entrepreneurial joint uh, journey that, that has sort of popped up so far? Yeah. I mean, so I, I love what, I love what I do. I love what I do and and what the essence of my company Minerva 6 does is really focused on relationship intelligence and you know what they called you know from back in the 80s and has transitioned throughout from a soft skill perspective you know it is now I think at, at, at near its pinnacle of concept is this relationship and intelligence component within the workplace is you know I had to make a hard choice of when I became a recipient of the Medal of Honor, it excluded me from doing a, a lot of things that almost all the things that I I knew how to do at the very best of my skill set for my entire adult career. So there was no options of, you know, it was one of the reasons I ended up having to get retire because of the restrictions around becoming a, a recipient, which I find to be ridiculous, but are just some unwritten laws within within the the military and U.S. government. Which can you expand on that a little bit? Like, what are the restrictions? yeah? So, so it, it's one of the things we've tried to combat uh, from the from the next generation of of soldiers that have received the medal since nine eleven was getting the military to remove the restriction of recipients going back into combat. And, you know, we're, we're, we're professional war fighters and had done it for nearly 20 years. And there's other people that are in my same shoes, but it really stems back from uh, world war two and a, 
a Marine gunny sergeant named Johnny Bassalone, and he received the Medal of Honor in Guadalcanal. And then he came back and they, they spun him around the country doing war bond tours, and it really drove him mad. And a, a lot of complication that came out of that of being a being a celebrity figure and a, you know, a, a token for uh, victories in, in the war in Pacific and World War II, you know, uh, uh, American pride. And he said, either give me a platoon and so I can lead men back into combat or else, you know, some, probably some bad things are going to happen to me because <laughs> he was going crazy. And so they finally relented and they, they said, okay. So he trained up with his platoon. And their next deployment was to Iwo Jima, and he was killed within the first couple of minutes of landing on Iwo Jima. And so ever since that day, there has been an unwritten rule that no recipient can go back into combat, not into combat theater, can go over into theater is fine, but to actually go back into combat, like on targets on the ground has, uh, been non uh it's been a non-starter so mm. it, it was one of the things that drove me out of the military and uh, be, because i there's a, a lot of reasons for that which can probably save for another time but it's like if i can't go back into combat with my boys how can you expect me to lead them so if i don't have that option to do that so that ends up precluding you from doing a lot of other things in various other government services that are, uh, you know, violence or ha but has a tendency to have uh, violence or any sort of type of uh, sin significant risk to injury job. So mm -hmm. it, which really sucks because it's what I've learned and knew and, and trained to my entire life. Right. So. Uh, so understanding that that is no, that was no longer a, ch a chapter in my life. And it was, you know, that's why it was a hard pivot. You know, what I've, what I've ended up doing was creating an organization, you know, Minerva six, which goes in to companies and, and teaches them about the things that really kept our units together. Right. And, and it's, nobody really thinks about it from this perspective, but in the special operations community, we put a tremendous amount of value within, you know, the, the soft skill side of the house, relationship intelligence side of the house about taking care of those who constantly volunteer to risk all right year after year, deployment after deployment, you know, people that have 15, 16, 17 deployments are had, you know, in, in over the, since 9-11, leading all the way up to our exit in Afghanistan, you know, it, it's, a, it's amazing what some of these individuals have done for our country. And, but why is it that they continue to do that? And it was, you know, at the end of the day, it's how you're treated within an organization, right? It's, it's not because you have tremendous amount of hard skills, you know, that's great. You need those to be part of that organization. So a very high level of competency, but it's how we looked at taking care of individuals. And that, you know, that really stems from SOCOM's uh, part of preservation of the force and family, which they call POTFF, you know, so all the, all the different, you know, systems they have in place and, and, and various programs they have in place to take care of the families while we're gone. And then how it is, we looked at it of taking care of the individual when you're gone 260, 300 days a year and you're back home and, and making or allotting time for when people need to be at, you know, can't miss events, whether it's big surgeries within family members or or significant, you know, milestones in their kid's life, definitely births, things of that nature. And that really comes from a relationship intelligence perspective of getting to know your people and, and understanding what it is that truly matters to them and making sure those are 
part of your no fail mission. Like we take care of those. And, and so with my company, I bring that level of insight into corporations. I want to create an elite uh, culture, you know, a, a different level of thinking and mentality with an organization where you're driving towards what I call this loyalty equation. Uh, and that involves a whole bunch of different metrics, but ultimately leads into a high level of trust and respect amongst the team members or employees within your organization where they end up being loyal to each other and they want to stick around because of the environment, the culture they're in and the environment they're in and knowing that they're probably not going to have that in a different organization, even if they were to get paid a little bit more money. Right. And so, so go ahead. So taking that one level deeper, how do you build that trust amongst the team? Yeah. So it's, is something that I coined in, and, and I really call it the, you know, a loyalty equation is, is first you got to start off with the, the inner self. And so it's like who you are as a person. It's like, what are your ethics? What are your, what are your morals? What are your values? You know, are you a person that has the willingness and the, and the, the ability to want to create, you know, bonds within an organization that wants to be part of, of, of something truly special or truly elite, right? Because uh, not everybody's like that, but there are a good majority of people that, that take a lot of good pride uh, from knowing that they have struggled well, that they've worked hard, and they're part of something that not everybody can be a part of. And, and so, uh, you know, do they have the right type of emotional intelligence? Do they have situational awareness? You know, are they, are they, do they have a lot of grit? Are they, do they have a, 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 a humility component that understands and a reason why strength humility is my personal motto is I take it from C.S. Lewis as the quote from humility. It's, you know, not thinking uh, less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less often. And I think that's a very important distinction because, you know, nobody wants to be with people that are insecure or have a massive amount of doubt about their abilities to do something, right? No, nobody wants to work around that. And that's where like competency and your hard skills come into place. You want somebody that knows I can do this. I know I can do this. I have the skill sets and the competency to do this. I'm very confident what I can do. But the humility component comes in going, I'm just not always thinking about myself all the time. I'm putting others first, which is where we have another mantra within the SEAL teams. It's about team gear, your gear, then yourself. And so everything starts with the self. And then you start to combine that with your surroundings and the people you work with. And then it gets into... You know, are you, uh, do you have, is there, is there vulnerability within your workplace, right? I mean, are you just constantly walled off from a perspective of uh, not being able to share anything with anybody? Like, or do, you, or do you refuse to let anybody into your personal world, even, even if you're in the workplace? And, and that's an interesting balance because- you know, some people look at work as just a job. I'm going to go there, do my job. Don't ask me for anything else. I'm going to collect a paycheck and go home. And that's not the type of people that usually end up or stay around in the organizations I go and consult with because that's not an elite mentality. That's not an elite cultural mindset. And, <laughs> you know, that's looking at it from a job instead of a way of life. And, in this day and age, it's the line is becoming more and more blurred around, you know, when do you work? When do you not work? We're connected to work all the time by electronics nowadays. And so taking a mentality of that's why you should, you should find jobs that you are competent at and that you have a passion for because 
then it starts to morph into something more than just a job. It starts to morph into a way of life. Like I'm not going to change the way I do things in my personal life and the way I do things in my professional life. I'm not going to have two separate ways of doing things in both those environments. They all become intertwined. And, and when you do that, you don't look at the hard things from a work perspective as, uh, as, as, as it sucks or I don't mm -hmm. want to you know, do this anymore. It's just, that's what it needs to get done and it's going to be hard and we'll navigate through that. And so you gotta, you gotta find people, you gotta have yourself become, you know, vulnerable. Then you gotta be authentic. Right. And in this, in when you start acting with other, other people, you know, it's, so there's this component of vulnerability, this component of authenticity. There's a component of, of time, uh, that's required within, within the workplace. And then over that people get to see how you're, you're interacting and, and who you become. And that starts to build trust. And then you, uh, you, once you start to have that trust, uh, you you combine that with uh, you know some other aspects of so basically it's like time squared, and you start to build respect. A respect will start to build around those that you work with and that you've had these shared experiences with, that you've had authentic moments with, you know, vulnerable moments with, and and that you you're in an environment where there's transparency in, in what you're doing. And that all builds to this loyalty aspect. And, and that's what happens uh, definitely in the SEAL teams, but in like special operations a lot, because we all start together and go through these very adverse, you know, training programs where there's selection processes that happen. And you get to see people when they're tired. You get to see people when they're vulnerable. You get to see people when they're, you know, they're not at their best. And how they navigate that and how they hold themselves and compose themselves. And that's where, you know, so we're able to streamline and hyper accelerate this process. And, 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 uh, that's what I try to recreate within these organizations because, you know, we, we there's too many people nowadays, uh, and there's too many organizations nowadays that, you know, look very close. They, they just look, they're waiting for the next job that's going to offer them twenty more thousand uh, dollars a year because they don't. It they're hard time of putting an ROI on the soft skill relationship intelligence side, you know, of the house. And in, in the same token, it's uh, a, a lot of a lot of companies do not exercise the diligence aspect of looking at most likely course of action or most deadly course of action for their business and they make decisions in the here and now and then markets change and 12 months later you know they end up having to get rid of 20 percent of their workforce which creates a lot of uncertainty within environments right and so uh and so at that point you know you, you see companies as just being a machine that ingest people and spits people back out and so there's this cycle that ends up happening as people experience in that and so they are conditioned to start thinking in that way and and so there doesn't end up being a whole lot of loyalty to an organization right so yeah at, at any moment that they're offered a better environment or better pay they jump ship because they're like you know the company is more than likely going to do that to me anyway. So why would I not do the same, same back to them? And, and so, uh, I, I take a lot of pride and pleasure in, in nowadays. And, and it's why I, I, I thoroughly enjoy my job because it's the closest thing I, I can get to that experiencing, uh, what life was like back in on an elite team and watching companies grow over the course of that consulting period. And how they see retention skyrocket. They see, you know, there's a whole lot less people that are let go from the organization because they're finding the right cultural fit in, in their recruitment assessment and selection process, right? So they're taking more time and in in, in diligence in 
and reviewing that. And it, it's really good to see that from when they first start and, and when they, where they sh end up a year later and they have a lot less conflict in the workplace because they're communicating in the right manner. And it, that part's really rewarding. Are you working with all sizes of companies or is there a certain size or sector that you're focused on? So I like small to, to, to medium sized companies. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I like organizations where they're, it's a founder owner, and this is probably their second, third, or fourth, you know, company, def definitely in the third or fourth company where they've, they've made a lot of mistakes, you know, in the early days, maybe some of their businesses didn't work out that well. And, and this is the company that like, I'm going to look at this from a different reproach. They typically have already bought into the idea of, I want to create something different. And that's usually because of, you know, some of the great business books out there that come from the special operations community. They're like, man, I, how do I, how do I get something like that? And so there's, there's buy-in <laughs> and willingness from the, the get-go of, of creating a environment like that. And so to do that effectively, one, it takes time and it takes a willingness from, from leadership because leadership drives and creates and sets the culture. And it's the teammates and employees that set the personality of organizations. And so there has to be a adoption of the mentality and of the practices by leadership or else really nothing's going to, you know, mm -hmm. take root. And so, um, so it's hard to do that in large organizations because they're just so big and, and they're a machine at this point. They're like, they're like a million, it's an institution, it's an enter enterprise. And, and, and so it's, it's really hard to get bigger organizations to do it. I would love it. And, uh, and you can do it for certain departments, but then that department ends up becoming somewhat siloed because no, nobody else that they're interacting with in the organization is, a, is adopting any of the concepts that they're, uh, that they're learning or prescribing to and, and, and acting with. And in the ones that I have done, they, they've seen great growth inter, you know, departmentally within their organization, but the, the real where I really like to work is in the, in the small and medium sized companies that have a great growth trajectory, you know, are, they might have had 200% growth on their employees in the past 12 months, you know, great cash flow in the, in the company and they're, they're moving out and accelerating in a manner that uh, would be atypical compared to their peers. So they understand that, look, if we're going to, if we're going to grow at this rate, we are very susceptible to losing our cultural identity as an organization, mm -hmm. especially when you onboard this many people at this, this speed. And so, you know, they, they say an organization, the face of an organization or the identity of an organization changes every time it grows by three, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. And so. In those early stages of the company, like what you set as the foundation, what you implant within the organization uh, is, is ultra critical because if you get so far down the line, you're trying to dig up and replant stuff that is, you know, to get down to the root level is buried within under, you know, decades worth of various doctrine or policies or things that it just becomes exponentially harder to do that yeah, that's, uh, so that, absolutely. that's where i like to focus um, and we've got lots of entrepreneurs that follow this podcast do you also deliver that material in a keynote session like, are you doing presentations i i do i so one of my verticals of, of of revenue within my business structure is i, I do lots of, of public speaking all shapes and sizes uh you can think of from elementary schools all the way to 
private organizations to big galas, you know, so, and it really just depends on what the client's looking for is what I, I, I create and, and deliver. And some of those are, are just our speeches at galas. Some of them are, are keynote presentations that walk through, uh, lessons on life and leadership from a perspective of, uh, you know, my perspective and, and I do those frequently. So yeah, probably so edit once or once or twice a month, I'm at some organization doing something like that. So that's very good to know. And we'll include links on our show notes to your public speaking website and, and everything else. Um, and if an audience member wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. They can either reach out through my, my website and, it, you know, www.minerva6.com spelled out uh, S I X.com. And you can post, uh, there's a, a portal there to send a message, uh, to do that. Yeah, I'm also on, you know, Instagram at Edward C. Byers is my, uh, handle. And that's another, another way that people can reach out to me through there and, and, but a, a lot of, a lot of times, a lot of what I'm doing just becomes like a word of mouth. Nice. Uh, they, I get passed on to the next person and, and, and next thing you know, I'm, you know, on another call or conversation about coming to their organization because of somebody that they knew, which is, I think the best type of advertising out there for sure. That's a hundred percent right. Um, and you know, your marketing is working. If the phone's just ringing because of word of mouth, you're doing something right. That's correct. And it's been awesome having you on the show. I could chat with you for hours and hours and dig into lots of different details. Your life lessons, your lessons around leadership are really impactful. Um, audience members, if you got some value out of the show, please like this show. Please subscribe to the podcast. Please share this episode with your friends and family. Um, let's celebrate Ed's knowledge and his experience. I love the way you started off the call to uh, the podcast today. And we talked about the only easy day is yesterday. That is something to take home with me forever. Um, Ed, thank you again. It's been a pleasure having you on our show. Well, Greg, I, I appreciate that. And to everyone listening, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and have a Happy New Year. Thank you for tuning in to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. To hear more inspiring stories and strategies around the endurance mindset, be sure to subscribe below or visit us at chiefenduranceofficer.com. Until next time, keep pushing those limits.